Of course, Christians say the best sources of information on the life of Jesus are the Gospels. But critics would throw those out anyway, so let's look at extra-biblical sources that confirm Jesus' existence. We have the thoughts of the Greek philosopher and critic Celsus, preserved by the Christian writer Origen in his book Contra Celsus. And since, in imitation of a rhetorician training a pupil, he, Celsus, introduces a Jew, who enters into a personal discussion with Jesus, and speaks in a very childish manner, altogether unworthy of the gray hairs of a philosopher, let me endeavor, to the best of my ability, to examine his statements and show that he does not maintain, throughout the discussion, the consistency due to the character of a Jew. For he represents him disputing with Jesus and confuting him, as he thinks, on many points. And in the first place, he accuses him of having invented his birth from a virgin, and upbraids him with being born in a certain Jewish village, of a poor woman of the country, who gained her subsistence by spinning, and who was turned out of doors by her husband, a carpenter by trade, because she was convicted of adultery, that after being driven away by her husband and wandering about for a time, she disgracefully gave birth to Jesus, an illegitimate child, who, having hired himself out as a servant in Egypt on account of his poverty, and having there acquired some miraculous powers, on which the Egyptians greatly pride themselves, returned to his own country, highly elated on account of them, and by means of these proclaimed himself a god. Of course, it wasn't only non-Christians outside the Bible who were talking about this. A first century church leader in Rome, Clement, wrote about Jesus in a letter. Let us therefore be lowly-minded brethren, laying aside all arrogance and conceit and folly and anger. And let us do that which is written. Most of all, remembering the words of the Lord Jesus, which he spake, teaching forbearance and long-suffering. Let us fear the Lord Jesus Christ, whose blood was given for us. Let us understand, dearly beloved, how the Master continually showeth unto us the resurrection that shall be hereafter, whereof he made the Lord Jesus Christ the first fruit when he raised him from the dead. The historian Phlegon wrote about a man named Jesus. His original work no longer survives, but it is quoted later on by Origen. Now Phlegon, in the 13th or 14th book, I think, of his Chronicles, not only ascribed to Jesus a knowledge of future events, although falling into confusion about some things which refer to Peter, as if they referred to Jesus, but also testified that the result corresponded to his predictions. So far we have a Christian and two non-Christians, not only describing Jesus, but describing things that he did. In addition, Lucian of Samosota was a Greek satirist who wrote The Death of Peregrine sometime after the year 165 AD. He mocks Christians in it, saying, The Christians, you know, worship a man to this day, the distinguished personage who introduced their novel rites and was crucified on that account. You see, these misguided creatures start with the general conviction that they are immortal for all time, which explains the contempt of death and voluntary self-devotion which are so common among them. And then it was impressed on them by their original lawgiver that they are all brothers from the moment they are converted, and deny the gods of Greece, and worship the crucified sage, and live after his laws. Another critic of Christianity, the Jewish historian Josephus, said this, Now there was about this time Jesus, a wise man, if it be lawful to call him a man, for he was a doer of wonderful works, a teacher of such men as received the truth with pleasure. He drew over to him both many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles. He was the Christ. And when Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men among us, had condemned him to the cross, and those that loved him at the first did not forsake him, for he appeared to them alive again the third day. As the divine prophets had foretold these and ten thousand other wonderful things concerning him, and the tribe of Christians so named from him are not extinct at this day. Lastly, the Roman historian Tacitus wrote about Emperor Nero in his work Annals. Nero had a bad report against him. Consequently, to get rid of the report, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations, called Christians by the populace. Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hand of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilatus, and a most mischievous superstition, thus checked for the moment, again broke out not only in Judea, 
the first source of the evil, but even in Rome, where all things hideous and shameful from every part of the world find their center and become popular. According to many online sources, Jesus was not only not God, but he didn't even exist. Also, I noticed a disturbing trend in the comments section of my last video, where people seemed to think the evidence pointed towards mythicism instead. To say that Jesus was a total myth is to be on the fringe of the fringe of beliefs about Jesus today. Even skeptical scholars acknowledge his existence. Most of these quotes come from critics of Christianity from early on. It would be very easy for them to expose it as untrue, or to expose that Jesus never existed, but they didn't do that. The next time you hear someone saying Jesus is a myth, help them not to make that same mistake.